I will talk about the business process of machine learning. So uh, I work at Neuraxio. I'm actually the, the founder and we're doing a lot of machine learning and deep learning projects, uh, processing time series, as well as natural language. First, this is not a technical talk. And also this will be super fast paced <laughs> because normally this talk takes me one hour or more. And uh, now we just have 25 minutes and it's normally also a ped talk. So I will be doing it for free right now. First, as an introduction, what is AI, ML, DL? So artificial intelligence is a general term that has been introduced in the 1950s. And it's a big umbrella term uh, that uh, contains the machine learning and deep learning. You can think of algorithms that can solve chess automatically, stuff like that, pathfinding algorithms. Well, it is a very varied set of algorithms where the machine can solve problems. Then there is machine learning, which have appeared more recently in the 80s. And it is then that the algorithms you program start learning some behavior and rules from data to do predictions or to take some actions in the real world. So here you can talk about statistical model being fitted on some data. And uh, most of the time you will see a supervised learning process where you give some examples, training examples to your algorithms, an input and, a, and an expected output. And the machine learning model is the mapping between the two and it learns to predict the good output given the inputs. So you can start seeing artificial neural networks in machine learning algorithms. Although there are other machine learning algorithms such as most statistical regressions, such as, for instance, logistic regressions. And finally, there is deep learning, which is much more recent uh, due to unlocking some cool mathematical tricks to allow for deeper neural network. A quick rule of thumb could be that a neural network that has more than two layer in depth, layers of stacked uh, neurons, uh, one on top of another, if you have two, more than two layers, then it is considered deep learning. In fact, this is a very cheap rule of thumb. The definition of deep learning is uh, much more uh, subtle than that. Uh, but for now, let's proceed with that. So the supervised learning process, how does it work? Well, you have an artificial neural network here in the center and you present to it some kind of input. It could be an image, some text. Uh, sensor readings, things like that. And you want to predict something that might be uh, what is found in the image, what is the sentiment in the text, something like that. Um, in how much time would a consumer buy again this product? What should we recommend? Things like that. So you have an expected target during the training. So you present something, you predict something, and you want to compare the prediction to the target it is very similar to solving a mathematical textbook exercise where you read the question, calculate and generate the answer, and then correct yourself uh, when you go read uh, what was expected as an answer. And then uh, by comparing what you did to that, you can adjust the weights of the connections between your neurons uh, so that you do not do this error again. So it is about minimizing the error given many training examples. So this is supervised learning. Then uh, this implies a lot of things for a software project. So you will have phases. Uh, the first one is to establish a goal, the data analysis and problem analysis. Uh, most of the questions you'll ask yourself uh, that will be important will be in this phase. So is the project even possible? Uh, if so, clarify the scope and the goal to solve the good problem. And uh, finally, what will be the prototype that you will program and uh, what will be the required data format? A problem we often see is that you have a business goal that might differ from the data you have at hand and you wonder what kind of machine learning algorithm you could apply to the data to solve your business goal, whereas you probably need to do some predictions or to take some actions and you want to automate this task. So this, this can be very complex. 
and it is not to be overlooked because one of the main uh, failure reason for machine learning projects is having a goal uh, or a, pro a problem definition that changes throughout the project. And it is very uh, a good thing to define that properly at the beginning to avoid surprises and avoid restarting from scratch. So afterwards, you have the data acquisition and preparation step of your project. This can take up to two months. Sometimes you're lucky and data is already well formatted, but this is often not the case in business projects. Uh, and then you do a prototype. So this can take one to three months on average from what I've seen. And uh, you, you basically do just the strict minimum to achieve results. Then you do an MVP, a minimum viable product, which is a bit better than the strict minimum uh, prototype in a way that it is uh, functional and it can be uh, showed to people and even sometimes used in an alpha or beta version of your app or, or, or project. Uh, so you get the prototype to a first usable version. And then uh, you deploy and you iterate on that uh, with some improvements. And this can take up to an infinity uh, amount of time. So you must know what's ahead to succeed a machine learning project. 87% of machine learning projects doesn't go to production. So when you begin the prototyping and the acquisition and everything, you need to be sure and prepared to commercialize your project. At the end, there are so many things that can go wrong in those kinds of projects if you don't do things properly, the data, uh, the prototype, the licenses, the, the algorithm, the quantity of data, so many things to consider. So the, 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 the most important one is the problem definition at the top, as we can see here. So for instance, you may want to program a sentiment classifier. So, okay, you've got your problem, your inputs and your outputs are clear, and you can do a supervised learning on that. Uh, for instance, uh, so you have a, as an input, you have text, and as an output, you have happy, not happy. Now you need a metric to evaluate your model because you will train a lot of models uh, when working on the problem and uh, training them on the data. And you need to be able to pick automatically the best one. So your scoring metric should be a business metric. And uh, it is noted that this is different than the uh, training loss, uh, it is a metric that is really useful to select the best model. Once you've done this, the problem is well defined, then you can start to acquire and modify and pre-process your data such that the problem can be solved and that the data can be presented to the neural network or the machine learning algorithm. And you can in parallel start coding the machine learning algorithms. At Neuraxio, with our clients, most of the time we're doing this part at the right, and our clients are providing data. We can help them format the data in, in a good uh, way to uh, have the data meet the model at the middle here and solve the problem. So you will train the model on the data and analyze its uh, errors. And depending on, the, on, on what the errors are, you will either work on improving the quality of the data or the model. And at the end, you can deploy to production with real life data. So establishing a goal, well, it is about data analysis and problem analysis, as I've said, because the two meets at the middle ultimately to solve the business problem. So machine learning is abstract. It is not obvious. And even having uh, myself six to seven years in the field of machine learning and especially deep learning, uh, I found it hard at the beginning to uh, link algorithms to data set where things meet at, at the middle. Sometimes it's not clear. It requires a great deal of creativity and also a great knowledge of the, po the, the, the existing models and algorithms that can be used, as well as the existing data pre-processing techniques and a good business overview of the problem. So having worked on more than 57 artificial intelligence projects, uh, I realized that uh, someone uh, must have at least, let's say, four to five years of, of experience uh, to uh, be able to do those decisions right. So changing goal is very hard once coding has begun. 
it can be less hard with uh, Neraxel, which is an open source machine learning framework, and by using proper clean code uh, in your machine learning project. So analyzing things properly at the beginning is important. So as I've said, you want to uh, have a metric in your project to automatically evaluate your machine learning algorithm. Uh, so will you have reached your goal with your algorithm? So knowing this automatically is important. Uh, it is especially more useful for automated machine learning, uh, also called AutoML. Basically, this is hyperparameter optimization, whereas hyperparameters are like a genetic code for your machine learning algorithm. Uh, it is uh, like performing a search of the best model because you can parameterize your models and uh, you want to take the one with the biggest, the one with the biggest score. So establishing a business metric, uh, the goal setting phase will help. You want that the algorithm that you pick amongst the one you've coded or uh, in a way you param parameterize the, the, the algorithms you've coded. Uh, you want this to be done right so that uh, things are uh, really solving your problem. Gathering data. Ideally, you have data, right? Because no data, your project is at risk. Um, it's like half of the project uh, or more. Sometimes it's okay to use public data or someone else's data. In fact, it's, it's most of the time uh, what's done in the industry. Uh, coming up with some business deals, uh, checking the licenses of the data. Many things must be considered. And uh, after the, the first analysis phase, continuing a project without the data is hard. It's really hard to work on the part at the right here without the data because it is with that that you can iterate and improve the whole system. So without the oil in the, uh, the, the system, uh, it's hard to uh, make it work properly. So. Uh, if there's no data, uh, it is required to create synthetic data to be able to advance before the data is obtained. So uh, yeah, uh, to, those projects can be hard, but not impossible. I, I've seen uh, companies successfully do it without data at first. And data splits. It is a good thing to split the data into train, validation, and test sets or splits. And basically you train your model with the supervised learning uh, for instance, uh, process on the training data, and then you you use the validation data to pick the best model. And after having done that and selected the best model, you can uh, test it again uh, with the test data and and see the score not only in the validation data but the, on the on the test data. And by the way, validation data and test data sets should be from the same statistical distribution. Um, so what you're doing when you're testing like that uh, as well is that you're double checking that you weren't just lucky picking the best validation, the best model at validation. Uh, you should obtain similar scores at the validation phase and test phase. Uh, also validation is sometimes called the development set in other literature. So uh, basically the training set may be augmented because you want your, your validation and test splits to represent the real problem you want to solve and you want to evaluate in a way that is uh, as close to the reality as possible on the business side. So um, you may increase uh, your uh, variety of training data for making your machine learning model more robust to unseen uh, situations, for instance. It might help the, the model a great deal sometimes. So typical data set splits, uh, we often see 70% uh, of the data in the train set uh, when there is low data. And uh, in, in case of big data problems, well, it's uh, more a bigger proportion of the data can go to the training due to the central limit theorem here, uh, making less required uh, bigger and bigger uh, testing data. So it, 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 it's good to work like that. So as you see here, we split the data, train validation test, we train the model in it, and we can analyze the bias and variance. This is uh, also referred to as sometimes the uh, underfitting and overfitting. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's quite related. And um, basically you're comparing the train, uh, the, 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 the evaluation metric of the model on the training set and on the validation set. Uh, as well as comparing it, comparing it to expected performance or 
to human performance. And by seeing the differences in the uh, the way the metrics come up with the, the, the scoring, then you can decide, should I improve the model or should I, should I improve the data? Because we'll see later, uh, it can give hints on the, the, the parts we can we should work on next. So once everything is fine and that the, the validation is, is good, we can measure test performance and deploy to production with real life data. So uh, if there's a difference, then it means we, sh we probably have a bug somewhere. So uh, by the way, data influence the choice of the best model a lot. So uh, a, a rule of thumb is that the more data you have, uh, in general, the better it will be to use a deeper, more complex model rather than a more simple model. So if you have a, a few, a small amount of data, then you want to use classical machine learning algorithms probably, or maybe even worse, some uh, very simple hard-coded rules of thumbs, which wouldn't even be machine learning anymore. And uh, this is uh, here, so this, this chart here is for a hard deep learning problem, such as, for instance, speech to text or text to speech or uh, machine translation. Uh, so uh, it, it, tools are a context in which the, 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 your models, your machine learning algorithms performance uh, can be uh, very good with more intelligence and bigger quantities of data. You know, if you were to solve the problem of an addition, let's say two plus two equals four, then you wouldn't need all of these uh, sophisticated algorithms. So uh, tools algorithms should not be used for fun on uh, simple problems. It's good for learning, but you don't want to overdo it. You want to pick the simplest model possible that will obtain the best results on your data. So let's say you train a medium neural network on your data and that you have uh, some, some quantity of data here. Uh, well, uh, this might be a good fit, uh, but otherwise, if you were doing a deep learning model uh, on a low amount of data, then uh, it would probably fail overfitting. And on the other way around, if you were to use a uh, less complex algorithm on, on this uh, medium amount of data, then it, it would be bad. You, you might be better off trying a, 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 a better algorithm. So this is where automated machine learning comes in handy because you can automatically test, automatically test different models where you parameterize the number of neurons in your models, the number of, of layers that are stacked one onto another in depth and the learning rate and stuff like that. And you can pick the best model according to your problem. And you can also test uh, not only uh, different parametrizations of your model, but also you can test uh, different algorithms and pick the, the, the best one. You can even configure the data pre-processing techniques in automated machine learning as such. So uh, if your model is too complex here, far to the right, well, uh, your error, which is the vertical axis, uh, will be low for the training and high for the validation. Uh, this is simple. Well, if your model is really intelligent, and uh, it sees some date, training data, it will be tempted to memorize it uh, perfectly. And it might fail to give predictions on some unseen new data so much it, it was intelligent, it, 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 so much it was intelligent, it memorized the data. And in the other case, uh, that is the perfect case, well, your model is not too complex, so it will be forced to learn the underlying rules in the data to come up with the lowest possible validation error. Uh, and so this is a perfect fit. And the, the other case is if your model is too simple, well, you'll do bad on both your training uh, error and your validation error and your uh, underfitting. So underfitting is to the left here and overfitting is to the right. This, this chart is related to this one as well with the curves, uh, whereas here would be uh, overfitting uh, compared to the blue line to the left and to, to, to the right would be overfitting. So uh, the effect of data uh, quantity on error uh, can be uh, quite important as well. So let's say you have a model of a given complexity, then uh, if you have a low quantity of data, uh, your model might do right on the training data. Like, okay, it's not too complicated to memorize just a few training examples, 
but it will fail to really grasp what's underneath the data and will fail to generalize properly to new data. If you add more data for this model with a given complexity, then you will reach a point where uh, your model is, is doing a bit worse on every training example uh, because it cannot memorize each of them perfectly. However, your model will have properly generalized the underlying rules uh, hidden under your data set such as when it sees new training, uh, new data uh, that is not in the training data, but at validation, for instance, or at the test uh, phase, well, your error will be much lower. So coding a prototype. Ultim ultimately, uh, you must face and uh, realize that you must customize the model to the data. It is not uh, as if you need to adapt the data to a model or it's not if you're shopping for a model, let's say. You need to come up with the good model according to your data and problem. Uh, you use the data and metric. Uh, so uh, metric is the business goal and you may need to customize the data pre-processing uh, for the model. Uh, but you know, you, you, you have your data is, is most of the time fixed and you have this. And so you train your models and the data. Before the MVP, you might want to re-optimize things for better results and do some reports to, uh, to show results to clients and investors with the prototype. Then you do a minimum viable product and deploy. Uh, basically, this is an improvement to either the model on the right side or to the data pre-processing to the left side of the uh, methodology chart I've showed uh, before you will want to retrain the model on the data uh, many times with the automated machine learning loop. So this is not magic. Uh, it is basically just a for loop, as I've said, uh, with some randomized genes for your models. So those genes are called hyperparameters. And there's a kind of genetic selection in your model such that you pick, you pick the best one. And throughout the loop, when you try models and models and models again with their specific hyperparameters, then you need a next model to try space exploration algorithm to uh, pick the, the next genes to try. So you have an exploitation versus optimization dilemma here with this algorithm, but it could be as well just random if you don't have the time to code that. Your, your computer will just run longer before uh, shooting out some good results. Um, so this is automated machine learning. It's not magic, but it's, it greatly helps. So finally, you want to, to iterate and redeploy. So uh, choosing what to work next. If data is lacking, gather data. If you don't have a good model, code a good model. If you train many multiple uh, machine learning algorithms back to back, work on the one that causes the most error first and briefly focus on the main points. And you guys uh, are working in JS a lot. Um, by the way, 80% of the machine learning ecosystem is in Python. So chances are that your machine uh, learning scientist uh, will work in Python or want to work in Python to go faster. Uh, this is changing. More libraries are appearing in JS. Uh, but what I recommend for the deployment is either of the two options uh, as follows. So you can use a Python microservice using your Axel, uh, and also uh, TensorFlow as well. And uh, you might other want, otherwise want to program a TensorFlow model in Python and then export it to disks and load it within TensorFlow.js. But you know, if your team is entirely working with, with in JavaScript and not with Python, you might as well want to be uh, working with uh, JS altogether. Um, but it, uh, it might be easier to uh, work with Python and connecting to a microservice using your front end uh, with a REST API, for instance. This is what I recommend still. Uh, also, it can be really interesting to code browser extensions and some stuff with uh, TensorFlow.js and uh, mobile apps with the model on the device. So uh, finally, there's the data and model quality equilibrium and redoing the green and red steps as new data comes is a must. So to conclude, um, yes, there is also the deployment iterations. So you collect the data, you prepare it, you split the data sets and train val test, train the model with the automatic machine uh, learning loop, validate and select the best model, and test the model, deploy it if it works good, and restart with new data as you collect it as you go. 
uh, sometimes you, you don't have this uh, loop, but uh, it's good if you have new data and can retrain your model. And if you need more better uh, scores, and if your data drifts over time and changes, which can be significant. So finally, you've achieved that. Your project works. You want to celebrate. And uh, also, don't forget to connect with us uh, guys at Neuraxio. Uh, you can visit our LinkedIn, Facebook, GitHub, YouTube, Twitter, anything. Uh, so again, this is me, Guillaume Chevalier, and uh, also Vincent Antaki, whom I've recently hired after uh, choosing amongst uh, more than 150 candidates who applied for this job. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Congratulations, Guillaume. Great presentation. And I have a first question for you. Yes. So Gone Drone asks you, so what's an, a typical number of neurons for a common problem like TTS or image recognition? Mm, uh, I haven't seen, I haven't counted exactly the number of neurons, uh, but I, I do have counted the number of connections between neurons, what we also call uh, parameters. So uh, often models can take uh, millions of parameters as such or uh, also even more recently, uh, it can be a lot more. And this can easily wait a few uh, gigabytes when serialized to disk, such as uh, uh, it can be for, it can be a few hundred megabytes to uh, let's say uh, 16 uh, gigabytes. Uh, sometimes you have really, really big models uh, when you save them from TensorFlow. And it can, it, it can, it can vary a great deal. So, um, the more you have uh, data, the more you will uh, probably need a lot of parameters to capture all of the nuances in the data. Cool. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, there is uh, one more uh, question from me. Uh, you said you worked on 57 projects with on uh, machine learning? Uh, I should specify artificial intelligence, but okay. not all of them are machine learning. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a really no, no, speaking question. artificial, yeah. artificial yeah. intelligence. Cool. Uh, so I wanted to ask you if uh, you would, uh, if what, how, how could you make the results of this projects better? Uh, uh, where was the bottleneck if you, uh, if you um, were working on that? Uh, was it uh, the uh, hardware, the software, or uh, or mostly your own ideas and? Uh, approaches how to how to make this uh, hmm. this uh, better really good point uh as uh, ray kurzweil which is uh, i think the uh chief innovator at google um the biggest problem right now is the algorithms so it is the model uh we have the computing power at hand to uh do all sorts of things and if not it's coming soon uh, with Moore's law that still is uh, in, improving uh, and, and not completely stagnant. And uh, it is really about finding the good abstractions and ways to connect the uh, neurons together and layers together to uh, get maximal uh, prediction results. So this is for really complex projects. In practice, I've seen that the biggest uh, fail reason are around clean code and uh, poor uh, code quality. So one thing is that uh, machine learning scientists and, da and data scientists should use, uh, sh should have a lot of skills both in programming and stats, not only one nor the other, nor half and half. So this is why it's a long, uh, it's a long decision to learn all of this and to be proficient in this. And at the beginning, you might not find easily a good job. Uh, well, it, it might be the case today, but when I started, it was really not popular. So uh, <laughs> uh, people wouldn't even know what it was. Uh, so I think we have another question. Yes, uh, so uh, Gondron again asks uh, one last question. Uh, what part of ML do you consider of most challenging? Free form, text parsing, NLP, convolutional, or is it all a matter of having good quality data? <laughs> well, having good quality data is always a problem. 
And uh, otherwise, uh, for instance, free form text parsing or just free text uh, in a natural way, it will take a lot of computing power to uh, uh, go through that. So I would say convolutional neural networks, uh, especially computer vision is, is mostly or uh, kind of like visited and seen uh it's been since uh, 2014 that, and, and 15 and 16 that computer vision has been quite okay and good and it, it's not the, the most challenging but uh the fact that half of the worldwide patents in ai are in computer vision makes me a bit uh well, yeah, i'm I, i'm better served in natural natural language processing projects and time series processing projects to have more freedom, basically, let's say. Um, I think uh, the most challenging right now is NLP. Uh, it is where there is prog progress right now. Text is indeed really complicated. Our ideas in interweaves together and stuff. Uh, well, natural language processing uh, is, is, is the thing right now that is, uh, most challenging, I'd say. And uh, yeah, computer vision is a bit uh, uh, solved behind. Now it's not completely solved. There are still lots of things to improve in computer vision and stuff, but it's, it, 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 computer vision has uh, like came to fruition before natural language processing for sure. So mm -hmm. in the end, good quality data is always a good uh, a problem. And uh, I've especially seen clean code to be a problem as well, whereas people code prototypes as research uh, students not caring about commercialization of their algorithms. And then they face all sorts of legal problems with the GPL license and stuff and other things and uh, the license of the data. And also the fact that they've just poorly programmed their project in a way that they only generate some results to publish in their paper, but it's not uh, in any way uh, some clean code that can be uh, deployed to production. It often depends on the disks a lot, loading data, pre-processing it, saving it to disk and reloading it, doing the prediction, saving the prediction to disk. It's not like if the thing was was going uh, uh, in and out uh, in production. Uh, so lots of, of challenges here I've seen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, this actually also answers my question, uh, which of these three is difficult. Uh, so the ideas are great. The hardware is also super fast and, and, and fine, but uh, the software in between is uh, <laughs> poor quality, let's say. It's, that's quite funny. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Guillaume. I, I, I invite you now to Remo. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to, to meet you, to have you here on stage today.